second session focuses upon the research process, so the different stages that are involved in doing research. And in the second half of the session, we focus very much upon the philosophical grounding behind research and what sort of approaches you may consider taking in your, uh, in your dissertation project. So, broadly speaking, we look at the stages of the, the structure of the research process and, crucially, how you can go about developing a focus and finding a topic that's of relevance to your, to your work. Um, crucially, we're going to look at how students can actually, because all dissertation projects usually begin life quite, quite broad and it's looking at that funneling process. So, how do students manage to narrow down to a particular focus? We're also going to look at different philosophies and approaches that um, are, are acceptable and used within social scientific research. Um, one of the most important uh, models and um, uh, process models you look at in this, in this particular series of lectures is the actual six stages of the research process. And just to reiterate them, first of all students have to identify a topic and we're going to look at that in terms of the research process today, how students can go about actually finding a topic and narrowing down. Once they have found a topic, they have to read the literature and define a research question and that research question question is so vital to how the whole process is structured. Once students have designed the question, they have to conduct, uh, determine how they will conduct their research and how they will collect their, their data. Um, they finally collect, sorry, they collect their research data and then um, analyze and interpret it to develop answers to their research questions that are explanations and will help them to develop a contribution to knowledge in some way. And finally, students finalize their dissertation, they finalize their thesis, which is the key arguments or takeouts that emerge from their research. So, identifying a research topic is often quite daunting and it takes a bit of time, a bit of trial and error, a bit of research, reading the literature. But it's the difficult first step of the process and students often begin, and it's very natural to begin very broad and, and very sort of overview areas. For example, I want to write my dissertation in human resource management. I want to write my dissertation in marketing. I want to write my dissertation in finance. They are very broad areas. Um, but the key to developing a dissertation is to develop a piece of work that is very narrow and very focused. And it's much harder to do an unfocused, broad piece of work than it is to do a narrow, focused piece of work. Because the narrow, focused piece of work um, is, is really what you're looking for. Because in that 12 to 14 weeks, you don't really have time to do a very expansive project. So it has to be very narrow, it has to be very focused. And one way we teach a, a, a at Royal Docs Business School is to try and think about the distinction between disciplines, areas and topics of research. So let's have a look at what we consider to be a discipline. A discipline are organized around um, fields of academic study and theories which have developed systematized bodies of knowledge ar around these particular uh, disciplines and have empirical generalizations that are, that, that are theoretically grounded. So when we're talking about disciplines, we are talking about areas like sociology, like business, like uh, psychology and like law. And when we're talking about interdisciplinary research, we're talking about the ways in which these disciplines may um, inform each other. So for example, in business research, we do have a lot of research that's informed by both sociolo sociological and psychological perspectives. So they are examples of disciplines, so organized fields of studies. Most dissertations, however, begin life in an area. So most students will have an understanding that they are working in business, but then they have to think about what area of research that they, they may be interested in exploring. So it could be HR, it could be marketing, it could be finance, it could be economics. And it's, they usually, they tend to be kind of subfields of, of that discipline. And students have to decide on what area of research they may be interested in focusing upon. These are by no means um, 
uh, complete. These are some more marketing related areas where students may consider, for example, consumer behaviour is an area where students may consider doing research. They may consider doing an, a research on sales management. They may consider doing research on brand management, on advertising, or for example, on uh, direct, or direct marketing or electronic commerce. So these are all general areas. Um, so how do you find an area that you might be interested in? Well, the key thing is to look at your modules and look at the, the subjects that you're learning and think about um, what kind of ways would you like to further your interest in that particular topic. Also, you, um, looking at key textbooks or journal articles you've been reading through your program, uh, considering assignments that you've done previously or presentations that might be useful, or you know, you may, for example, have some consumer experience or some practitioner experiences that you'd like to help frame your, your research topics. So lived experiences can often be embedded within research topics. Practical advice on finding an area on the top of the list really has to be your level of interest. You have to have some level of passion and enthusiasm for this, for this topic that will really translate into how you do your research. Obviously enthusiasm is very closely related to passion, but how enthusiastic you are about this? Is it something that you think will be very valuable or be very useful? And it should, in, in, in my own opinion, it should benefit your career in some way. So if, for example, you're doing a HR related topic, you may, for example, want to work in HR. So that, you know, it could be looking at employee satisfaction or motivation or something like that and that can in some way benefit or feed into your future career. So all areas, all general areas, have specific topics within them. And choosing a topic that has a focus, so for example, on the slides on point three, we've put up a, a topic of a dissertation from a few years ago in HR, looking at the relationship between job dimension and job satisfaction in SME organizations. So the key thing for students to try and do is to funnel down and think about how they're going to um, think about their topic. It will start off as a, as a general area and they will narrow down. So how do you identify a valid topic? Well, the first thing to do is to read your, your textbooks and your journal articles, but journal articles in particular are very valuable for this because journal articles are very research-based. They have the latest research, the latest uh, ideas, and they're articulated. Textbooks tend to be more teaching orientated, so I would recommend maybe looking at, at journal articles as opposed to um, textbooks. But one invaluable electronic source that's quite good is Google Scholar. So if, for example, you are interested in what had been written previously on a topic like brand relationships, for example, Google Scholar, as opposed to just general Google searches, is very good because it gives you very specific pointed results on what's been written previously. Also, what, what, what's useful is to discuss your ideas and, and, and your insights with your lecturers. We are, as we always tell our students here, we're here to help you. We're here to give you advice. We're here to give you um, some sort of guidance as to how you will go about your research. And we're always, as researchers ourselves, very happy to discuss the topics with you and, and, and what, 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 what would be a, a useful or interesting topic. Um, remember the whole meaning of research, which is research, which means you search and you search again. So you're actually looking for uh, ideas and topics and you, you can't just look once and then kind of say, oh, I, ca I couldn't find anything. So it's about trying to uh, look at new ways, new topics, new ways of envis envisaging particular aspects, just trying to focus on a particular uh, uh, area. It has to be an area where you can do research. So, for example, if it was looking at a CEO um, perspectives on remuneration, uh, that may be a very interesting topic, but unless you have access to CEOs, it could be quite difficult to research and practice. So it has to be something that's practical and something that you can research, and you have to read. The key to doing a research project is actually reading. So that means you read, you read your topic, you read your journals, you engage with them, and you actually have some idea of what the discipline actually looks like and what key questions are emerging. What sort of 
what sort of academic sources should you be looking for? Well, at UEL, and, and indeed as UEL students are working with our collaborative partners, you'll have access to our vast resources that we have access to. Things like EBSCO, Emerald Library, Science Direct, Sweatswise, are academic databases that have journal articles in every field imaginable, um, but particularly within business. And um, Google Scholar as well is quite useful. And for UEL-based students, the British Library is, qu is quite useful as well. But specifically, those databases are where you will find out what, what the body of knowledge is, what's been written previously, what, what, what gaps are emerging, and how you may possibly be able to address those gaps. So I've just kind of given you a diagram here that I think is quite useful of how we distinguish between um, you know, a discipline, an area, and a topic. And let's just have a look at the uh, consumer behavior track, for example. Consumer behavior is within the business discipline. Consumer behavior is a, a broad area itself. And within consumer behavior, there are very valid topics. For example, identity projects, gender, family relationships, etc. So that's how you narrow down to a topic. It has to be um, some aspect of that particular area that requires future research. And it's about funneling, narrowing down to that particular focus. If we take another example, if we look at um, uh, sales management, for example, sales management is very much part of the uh, business literature. But if you look at the sales management area, there are so many interesting topics within that. For example, key account management, sales marketing integration or the role of relationship selling and relationship marketing in sales management practice. So they are examples of topics that you can focus on within your research. So it's about trying to understand your discipline and understanding what areas are within your discipline and then thinking about what topics you can focus on within those areas and I think that is the, the, the key to getting started. The common problem with students beginning with a topic is not narrowing down to a specific focus. Okay? Saying, for example, my dissertation is going to be in brand management. Okay? Well, that's interesting and that's an interesting area, but it's not focused enough on a particular topic. So once you have a topic, then you've got a focus. Students sometimes want to do projects that don't have any academic grounding, okay? Where they can't find literature on that particular um, on that particular topic. Now, sometimes it just requires them to be given a little bit of a a little bit of focus, a little bit of a nudge in the right direction to say there maybe hasn't been anything written specifically on that particular aspect, but on related aspects there has been plenty plenty more written. So it's about trying to get that focus. Uh, that focus down. Some students for a 14 week project simply want to do too much. Okay, So they want to do uh, ask questions that are much more far reaching, more profound and are just quite difficult to answer in such a short period of time. So that narrowness, that focused aspect is, 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 is crucial. Sometimes students want to do projects that are just too complex, too cumbersome or just maybe simply are impractical. The CEO example being a, being a good one for example, wanting to um, interview CEOs if you don't have access to CEOs. So that could be, a, that, that could be an example of, a, of an impractical topic. So just to remind ourselves, we have these different stages of the research process, identifying a topic, formulating a question, deciding exactly on how we're going to conduct this research, then collecting the data, uh, analyzing and interpreting it, and finally finalizing the thesis, which is the answer to the research question. And your project must resemble that process in some way in order for it to be academically valid. So research philosophy uh, is a key aspect of, of, of the research process and really fits into the whole methodology aspect of your dissertation. So it looks at how research is developed and how knowledge is developed and what is the nature of knowledge. So how, when we look at ontological questions, we're looking at things like how do we see the world? And research questions uh, often shape the philosophies uh, which we end up adopting in our own research. 
So some key terms that we're going to look at in this particular session, and some of them are quite technical, but we're going to look at each one and try and explain them in, in, in kind of more everyday common sense terms, are um, paradigms, ontology, epistemology, axiology, realism, relativism, positivism, interpretivism and pragmatism. Okay, So we're going to look at these terms and look at how they relate to, to research generally. A paradigm is an accepted model uh, of scientific practice or a particular worldview that a scientific community may subscribe to. So it could be a, a, a view or some sort of a commonly held assumption that a scientific community may hold. So for example, people in service dominant logic and marketing are firmly of the view that the consumer is a co-producer of marketing and that uh, everything can be seen as a service even uh, you know, things that were traditionally seen as tangible products, they see them as services. So that is a, that is a fundamental assumption of so service dominant logic researchers. So um, paradigms consider how do scientists view the world or that particular problem? What are the assumptions that guide paradigms within a specific discipline? And really, if you want to know a little bit more about paradigms, it's important to look at Kuhn's original work, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, who clearly shows us that paradigms exist as long as scientists and their, and, and their supporters and those who subscribe to that worldview will support that paradigm. And if, if um, research in the discipline moves on, there is what you call a paradigm shift, where people move from one worldview to a different one. Um, ontology is very much concerned with what the um, what Germans what Germans would call Weltanschauung, which is worldview. So it considers how we as human beings view the world. So do we see the world as having objective, tangible structures that can be measured, or is it something that's more socially constructed through interaction and language and discourse? Epistemology is concerned with the theory of knowledge. So. How can we know what we know? How is it possible to find out about the world in which we live? And what is it, so very much concerned with what is it possible to know? And how is it possible to know what we know? Okay, so again, quite, quite philosophical. Axiological uh, questions are concerned with the overriding goal of research. So what is the overall purpose of the research that we're involved in? Is it about predicting? Uh, having some sort of an explanation or prediction of variables, or is it about understanding? Is it more discovery orientated or more exploratory? So the axiological goals are concerned with the overall goals of the research. In um, the textbook that we've recommended for this particular module, Thornhill, Saunders and Lewis, uh, 2009, um, they very clearly outline four uh, research philosophies and um, that dominate management research. And we're going to just look at these four tables and uh, consider their, um, uh, these four, four philosophies rather, and consider uh, the different components of each part. So we're going to first consider the ontological perspective in relation to these four philosophies. So it's looking at the nature of reality or the nature of being. So if we're looking at positivism, positivists traditionally see the world as having external, uh, an objective existence with independent social actors. So it, it tends to be a, an approach that's quite uh, structured around measurement and um, quantification. From a realist perspective, uh, realists see um, re reality as objective, as existing uh, independently of human thoughts and perceptions, um, but it is interpreted through social conditioning. So it's impossible to make an interpretation um, of, of that reality externally of your um, uh, human perceptions or thoughts. Interpretivists see reality as socially constructed and subjective. So it may, it may change and it's multiple and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really created through social interaction and discourse. Whereas pragmatists um, kind of have a, have, have a very sort of, uh, they have a view that's somewhere in between. So they see uh, reality as external, multiple, and it's uh, 
the view chosen to best enable answering the research question. So it's adopting a philosophy that's very much tailored towards addressing your research question. So it's not being too focused on any particular uh, approach and not being too ideological, but adopting a philosophy that will best enable you to address the research questions that you're asking. Moving on to the epistemological assumptions that, that drive our research, which is what is it possible to know and, and how is it possible to know it? From a positivistic perspective, only observable phenomena provide credible data or facts. So it's looking at causality, the relationship between variables, or generalizations, or reducing phenomena to simplistic evidence. So sometimes called a more reductionist approach to, to, to research. Uh, realism uh, posits, uh, from an epistemological perspective, that only observable phenomena provide credible data and facts, and insufficient data means inaccuracies in sensations, okay? Alternatively, phenomena create sensations which are open to misinterpretation. So uh, the focus is on explaining within a context or contexts. So it's still quite, um, it draws upon uh, quite similar ideas to what would be considered positivistic. Interpretivism is looking at subjective meanings and social phenomena. So looking at the details of a situation and um, behind um, a reality behind these details but actually looking at subjective experience, subjective meanings and what they can tell us about a particular context or uh, idea. Pragmatism again being being uh, a very open philosophy uh, can see either observable phenomena or subjective meanings as providing acceptable basis for knowledge creation uh, in a discipline. And they are dependent upon the research question. So the question will really determine what the, um, you know, what the philosophy will be. But it's very much upon a focused, applied approach uh, and integrating different perspectives to help um, interpret and make sense of the data. Um, in terms of axiological assumptions, so the overriding purpose or uh, the view of the, uh, the role of, of values in research, from a positivistic perspective, research is undertaken in a, in a value-free, objective way. Okay, So it's the separation between researcher and researched. And um, research is taken in a way that's independent uh, of the data and maintains an objective stance. So separation in positivistic philosophy is very important. The idea that the researcher, uh, researcher's values or ideals do not guide the research in any particular way. For realism, research is seen as having some sort of value laden, so value ladenness. So the idea that you can't interpret or make sense of the world independently of your perceptions or sensations. And it sees the researcher uh, as biased by, you know, worldviews, etc., cultural experience and upbringing. And the, what these do, these end up doing, is they end up impacting upon the research in some way. So it's, it's acknowledging that you cannot make an interpretation of reality outside of your own perceptions or independent sensations. Interpretivism um, slightly even more overplays the notion of, of, the, of value. So research is seen as value bound and the researcher is an implicit part of what they're researching. So if you're part of a community and you're researching that community, uh, your role within that community will impact upon how you interpret the data. So it's impossible to separate yourself from what's being researched. So that objectiveness that's seen in positivistic research, where there's a separation between researcher and researched, that boundary collapses within interpretive work. And pragmatism sees values as playing a large role in interpreting the results, and the researcher adopts both can adopt both objective and subjective points of view. So it's um, again uh, being guided very much by the research focus and the research question rather than being ideologically channeled towards a particular philosophical stance. 
And the final aspect is related to data collection and what sort of methods are used and techniques are used. So for positivistic research that has that objective separation between researcher and researched, it tends to be highly structured, it tends to rely on large samples and measurements, so predominantly a quantitative approach. However, it is possible to do positivistic qualitative research. So research that actually sees reality as measurable and sees separation between researcher and research as in embedded within the philosophy. So qualitative and quantitative can be used but majority of positivistic research tends to be of a quantitative um, uh, quant quantitative approach. For, real, for, for realism, methods are chosen to fit, fit the subject matter. So again, qualitative or quantitative approaches tend to be used. For interpretivistic research, it tends to rely on small, in-depth samples and investigations. So it's very uh, exploratory, quite, quite, quite small samples. And for pragmatism, mixed methods or multiple method designs, be they qualitative or quantitative, can be used for the, for the research. So you've got different philosophies there, positivism, realism, interpretivism and pragmatism and different methodologies that are used and incorporated within those particular approaches. One uh, framework that's used quite a lot in social science is Burrell and Morgan's um, uh, sociological paradigms and organizational analysis framework and they outline four different uh, paradigms within social science. They look at the interpretive paradigm which tends to have more of an interpretive philosophy but it's not quite as, 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 as radical. So it's not about radical critique, it's more about critique within the framework of regulation. Radical humanist is looking at um, a, a kind of subjective nature of experience but also looking at that within a more radical, more critical, more kind of um, looking at wider social implications as well. So it's that whole notion of social change and radical change embedded within radical humanism. Functionalist tends to adopt a more what would be called logical positivist approach. So it is very objective and it has that kind of focus upon, upon regulation. So um, this is kind of traditional logical positivist sort of approach. And radical structuralist does take a kind of objective realist approach but has at its, at its essence uh, a focus upon change or, or radical change of some description. And I think for first students in social science you have to try and be able to map where you see your research on that particular um, typology. And I think it's a useful way of conditioning you, getting to think about how to position your work and what methodologies you may use to actually um, approach your research. So philosophy gives you an un provides you an understanding of how you see the world and where you stand in relation to your research. Positivism tends to be geared towards quantitative methods, whereas interpretivism tends to have a more qualitative approach. But methods um, are epistemological and they, uh, they can be underpinned by, by either ontology. So which, which philosophy tends to dominate the social sciences? Well in marketing, and if you look at one discipline in particular like consumer research, it was traditionally dominated by logical positivism, positivistic philosophy. And interpretive research, qualitative research in particular, was very much marginalized and really only started to gain prominence in, in, in marketing in the, in the uh, mid to late 80s. However, interpretive perspectives, qualitative perspectives in marketing and organizational theory and lots of other disciplines are much more common. So we have much more um, paradigmatic plurality in, 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 in the research that's done in social scientific uh, domain. Exploratory research tends to be what William Wells calls discovery orientated. It's about trying to make a big discovery in some ways. Developing an initial understanding, it tends to be very qualitatively driven and, and focus upon secondary data. For descriptive research, it tends to describe the population in some way. So it's looking at general trends or patterns and a lot of uh, quantitative survey research would fall into the descriptive category. Um, sometimes personal interviews can be used for description as well or survey instruments which tend to be quite popular for this type of research as well. 
finally, we have causal research. And causal research looks at the cause and effect relationship between um, and, and, and a dependent variable and independent variables. So this tends to be experimental, laboratory uh, orientated research, looking at, for example, the relationship between job dimension and job satisfaction. So examining that causal relationship between those, between those variables. Mixed method research then tends to use multi-method. So you can use survey, in, survey instruments, for example, with qualitative interviewing or with secondary sort of data, data analysis. And it can g gain really important insights into, um, in, into particular phenomena. One paper that's cited on the, um, on the slides is a paper by Arnold and Price, which looks at river rafting in Colorado. And they use structural equation modeling with ethnography and un unlock some really important insights into river rafting, or what they call in the paper river magic, and the whole consumption experiences associated with river rafting. And I think they show that that plurality of methodology was so vital to unlocking key insights into what it meant to, to go river rafting. Um, it's using kind of exploratory research often to test particular concepts or particular ideas. So if you look at sales marketing integration literature, you see a lot of qualitative research trying to find variables to test and then looking at the relation, the role of, for example, um, how sales marketing integration can impact upon organizational performance, but looking at the level qualitatively of sales marketing integration, which can be useful. Uh, descriptive or causal research can often test relationships between variables or look at hypothesis testing, so examining the hypothesis. And it's useful to do mixed methods, but it's quite difficult and it can be time consuming. For, from my own perspective and the students I tend to, to, to um, supervise, they tend to choose either a qualitative or quantitative approach. Mixed method research for uh, postgraduate level can be difficult, yet some supervisors really believe in, in the, the power of mixed method. So it's really up to the dialogue between you and your supervisor to decide what approach you're going to take. So some observations. Um, and you know these are kind of drawing upon some of the, the, the conclusions from the previous um, le lecture, which looked at the uh, research, uh, the, the the module handbook. The proposal is the first step of doing research, but you have to start off broad and narrow down. So actually deciding on what your, what your topic is and developing a question. And methodology is important, and having a philosophy that underpins the methodology and then having a, a, a data collection approach that is consistent with the philosophy that you have grounded your research in is really vital. And I think also it should, the uh, approach that you take to your research uh, should be um, informed by the questions that you are asking. So if you are asking more positivistic causal questions, then it requires you to take an either positivistic qualitative approach or a quantitative survey. If you're asking more exploratory questions, more discovery oriented questions, it may require you to take a more qualitative, more humanistic approach. But what's important is that you find a topic, design an appropriate question, and have a f philosophy and method that complements your, uh, your, your research in, in, a, in a meaningful way. Thank you.